Now we'll hear from Dr. Lochnane on serving the dual eligibles. Hi, so thank you. Um, I actually have some videos I hope will play because I thought it was time for videos today. So um, my name is John Lochnane. Um, I'm a physician, um, but uh, like a lot of the folks here, I, I have gone into medical leadership, including spending most of the last eight years at the C-suite, uh, different roles at uh, Commonwealth Care Alliance. So I wanted to create a, 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 a practice, a way of caring for patients that I wanted to be part of. So um, I spend about a third of my time really taking care of patients and a third of my time trying to think about what we do to improve that I want to still remain a doc. Uh, I've been a hospitalist, a primary care, palliative care. I always think of myself simply as someone's doctor. Then I figure out what the role they need me to be. So Commonwealth Care Alliance is a unique entity. I don't know how many of you know us. It was started in 2004 by Bob Master, who was uh, Medicaid director under Mike Dukakis and Lois Simon, who ran LTSS under Medicaid and was really the first in the country that used risk-adjusted premium to create both a payer and care delivery model. So we were one of the few plans that ever said, we want the sickest, most costly, most complicated, whoever you got that you can't take care of, we want to take care of them. And we're going to be the payer, we're going to be 100% at risk, but we're going to take care of them with you. So that meant two models. One was a primary care model, which was physical disability, intellectual disability, and there was what we call the RAP model, NPs, that went out and wrapped around um, the community primary care physicians and NPs. Around that, we built a lot of other programs. As I put up here, you can see exactly who we are and how we work. What I will say is we're a 4.5 CMS star-rated Medicare Advantage DSNP. That's pretty good. The reason that happens is we take care of these patients. Uh, we, in 20... Uh, 14th with really, I think, the first financially aligned one care under 65 duels. So that's taking care of that population that's both Medicare and Medicaid under 65, which you can imagine has a very high rate of behavioral health challenges at this point. So um, we, and, and I really came to this, this place, joining CCA in 2009, where I had dollars. I had dollars to actually create care systems that would work for patients, and I had the ability to renegotiate contracts around different programs. And over the ensuing eight years, we did the palliative care program, which I'll go into in a minute. We started an inpatient unit at Boston Medical Center and other main hospitals, and I could basically go and negotiate what we would do, which I really want to make a very clear statement that no matter how many good ideas you have, unless there is a financial model that shows some return on investment and a reduction in medical expense ratios, it's not going to go. When we asked about the C-suite thing, you know, the CEO reports to the board, the CFO reports to the CMO. You have to think about who's reporting to who and how long they're going to be there for. And ultimately, when I first started doing this, I would tell narratives. And then I would tell narratives, plus I would tell ROI. And now I'm telling ROI, MER, and thanks to Diane's work, we're going to publish data about what we're doing, and then I support it with narratives. Because ultimately, you can have a CEO who loves palliative care, and for some reason they're not there in two years. I know if palliative care is showing a good profit and loss ratio, my palliative care program is going to survive. If it's not showing this, then someone else with a narrative for something else that's just equally important may be of more interest to that CEO. So I can't say it enough that we literally it has to have a financial relevance that matches quality. The other thing I'll also say is almost every CEO I've ever worked with and every CMO I've worked with and, and been is that basically they expect the quality to be there, right? So that's, a, that's one of the expectations of the job of those under the CEO. So again, I really want to say when you're developing these, narratives are, are crucial, but you have to come in with a well-thought-out structured plan. And we're going to talk about community power medicine and how we're in the process of doing that. So again, I just wanted to go over, this tells you about our patients. So, you know, literally four plus chronic patients in the senior care options, it's 71%, it's 50%. I wanted to show you who we take care of. I'm actually gonna have the patients speak in their own voices. But this is, this is the population, and this is the population that we want. And the thing that I will really be clear about is, once we have a patient, our disenrollment rates are pretty, pretty small. So that's an important element that we can make investments up front to realize benefits as we go through. And what we learned with our one care is taking patients who had received no home-based or primary other care, there's a startup cost component to that. Bringing these patients in and doing the right medicine is expensive. The only way you can then maintain what you do is to care for them over time. And I think that had a real relevance to palliative care. The palliative care program itself was basically started in 2009. And the way we, we, we thought about it at this point is that basically we wanted to 
free it from three constructs. One was the dichotomous idea that patients die, as Diane had pointed out, where one day they're well and the next day they die. Basically, it doesn't mask physiology. And the way we instructed had no physiological component to what I saw as a provider in the field. We needed to break that down. Two, we need to change basically the wording about this. It's serious illness, not end of life. And, and, and that allows patients to have that conversation. And three, we needed to embed it in individualized care plans. And that meant that basically we never asked patients to choose hospice or no hospice. What we say is we're your primary care provider and payer. Here's the menu of options that you have, which include everything across the board. And then we're going to talk about how we make that individualized care plan come true. So I would challenge everybody to really think about that idea that it isn't simply a system of care, it's an individualized care plan that we need to develop a menu to meet. And I think that ultimately is people and, and patient centered as we move through. So I'm actually going to show the videos about our, our, our community power medicine program, which we developed that we had a gap after 6 o'clock at night, despite this wonderful home-based ability to provide care. After 6, we looked a lot like everybody else, which is call us, and we had two options. Can you wait till tomorrow till we see you, or can we actually go out and do something, which we couldn't, so you'd have to go to an ER. And this program that I'm going to show you the videos is basically started as another pilot where we changed what community paramedicines do in the community and basically went to uh, the OEMS office in Massachusetts as a pilot and said, we want to use community paramedics to change how we care for people. And I'm going to show these two videos, hopefully. Yes. And these are on YouTube, so there's no, no, <laughs> they're YouTubes. Every time I go to the hospital, we start from the beginning. I usually will spend on the My husband has a stage four congestive heart failure and uh, been taking care of him. Was was over 44 times. He was in the hospital maybe twice, sometimes three times a month. Really, every time I go to the hospital, I usually will spend on the first day nine, nine, nine and a half to ten hours in the ER, wait for a bed. No food in between. Maybe get some pain medications, Lasix. How do the ease here you get is your Commonwealth Care departments. I mean, they stepped up. They're the ones who came to me and said, we have this program. And I said, I loved it. I wish I knew about it before. EMS professionals who come to your home and are the nicest guys, and they will take care of you. It's been working amazing. This is now literally there is no difference whatsoever between the hospital and here. Since I started this care, um, it's actually kept me out of the hospital and kept me home. Stage four heart failure, you know, you don't have much time left. And this time I wanted to be with my kids and be with them instead of having to be with doctors and nurses, which are fun. I, I love all the nurses and doctors, but it, it's like, you don't want to be, you want to be in your bed, you want to be comfortable. You want to have, you know, everything that you worked for around you. It's nice to see that I have people who are in my corner trying to forgive for me. He's been spending a lot more time with the kids and everything. And he's a lot more happy. Daddy's going to pass away and we won't be able to okay, say goodbye to him or be with him. No, having them here is just knowing that I get to be with my husband. I'm the one who gets to be with him, gets to, you know, take care of him and, and anything he needs, I get to do it for him. So before we go on, um, she actually, this patient did pass away relatively shortly after that video. Um, and when I saw that video, we designed community paramedicine to care for all our patients, not just end-of-life patients, and that's going to be our next patient, because I don't know who's end-of-life most of the time. They're all on a trajectory, and I want to give that care that's right for them at that moment. When I watch that video, the two things that strike me the most is, number one, is I see his children there. And part of, I think, my job is running and being part of a dual eligible plan is to make sure that his children experience his death the best that they can that I want to reduce the trauma that they're going to experience from this so that as they grow up, they're not going to get into that cycle we see often see when you have trauma and other issues that move through. 
The, the second thing you didn't see there, my colleagues, uh, Toy and IGE, our current CMO, and uh, I, Ram, wrote uh, in, in the Health Affairs blog is about a, how we're basically a social ACO, the idea of a social ACO. And what you didn't see in there that his care was helped by Dr. Lachlan Farrow at BI where he was hospitalized. He had personal care attendants, which were funded by our health plan who could be there and help care for him on a very regular basis. He had an NP who went out to his home. He had specialized uh, palliative care RNs and MDs who went out to his home. And there was a significant amount of energy placed in keeping him home. He actually died in the hospital, which was part of the plan, because we don't, we're ag totally agnostic. We think what's best is what's determined. And in this situation, he thought that that probably was the best outcome for what he wanted. But ultimately, if you looked at the medical expense ratios, if you saw the decline from when he first started this, uh, this program to when he was in the hospital all the time, it was substantial. But again, we really are not as concerned about that in the sense because we're very, we're very cognizant to the fact that we want to do the right thing. But when you do good care and you do it people-centered, in general, folks will choose not to engage in the level of a default acute care you often see. I'm going to show a second video. We have actually one of my own patients to kind of also explain the program, but it gives you a different sense. This is a patient who's, um, whose life expectancy is minute by minute. She's just put almost 70 of those together because she has a chronic disease, and she has had a twin sister who I also cared for who passed away when um, her uh, had an equipment failure, and her life expectancy without the equipment is about six minutes. Okay? So she lives each and every day fearful about whether the CPAP machine is going to work or not that you'll see in the video. And that has impact in everything. And for her, dying of not having a CPAP is real because her twin sister, that's what happened. So again, she's giving me permission to talk about this, and it's on YouTube. But she does not want to go to the hospital. Once she went for a gallbladder and a well-meaning resident to try to uh, extubate her. OK, talk about a lack of communication. We've solved that because every time she goes to the hospital, we've now funded her PCAs who know her well to take care of her at Boston Medical Center. So when she goes in the hospital, the PCAs go in the hospital. And she's on our own unit. So again, I would like you to watch this and we'll talk a little bit about just uh, to wrap up kind of how to think about what innovation is and how to, how to really go about it. Thanks. I excuse the 70s music, but please. Monday, did they come out on a Monday night? Did they took my blood and they realized I was dehydrated, so they gave me an IV here. Then they gave me some medicine to take. Did they um, they were very professional. Did they told me everything they were going to do to me, so I didn't have to stress over that. time they were here he was here for about an hour and a half and um, I was amazed what they could do take your blood and get the results and give me an IV and I was amazed because I'd rather have everything done at home than go to the hospital I hate going to the hospital <laughs> prevents me from having to go to the hospital. When the paramedic was here, he called Dr. John, and they talked and uh, discussed the treatment and all. So that was great. That was, I felt very safe because my doctor was involved with the decision. So um, I think this is a wonderful program. I think that because of this experience and another 
paramedic program in Massachusetts in May, there are going to be regulations released to create community paramedicine across Massachusetts. Right now, this is a pilot program that served 1,500 patients in Eastern Massachusetts. It has a PCORI grant that's taking place, which will be, I think, very positive. We wrote a, pay, a perspective piece for New England Journal. We also had a mathematical study published in a white paper through Center of Healthcare Strategies. This program doesn't d disappears in a year if it's not financially viable. No matter how good it is and what it, what it can bring, we need to now go into this beyond this operational phase of what we do. And the challenge I really have for everyone in this room is that serious illness and dying in the United States is a very, very expensive process. And we looked at our, some of the data that we've done and we're going to start to publish was very much like we saw earlier. It's a reduction of cost. It's not going to be that you're going to drive it to zero or whatever we do. And that's an important element to do it. But, you know, one of the other things we started at CCA is what we call a venture accelerator, venture capital, industry ventures, to think about how we disrupt, how we take care and disrupt with technology, care models and such. And I see serious illness, end of life, is the most expensive and most ably disrupted area in the United States healthcare system. So much of it is futile, so much is based on old technology, and the movement forward has really happened in the last five to ten years about how we think about this. But this is the area I think that healthcare reform and healthcare in general should be focusing on. There's so many good ideas out there. I, I'm going to lift a hand. How many people took Uber here today or Lyft? How many did on demand driving? Why don't we have an on demand workforce of home health aides? and personal care attendants. We all know who care for patients that on the scale of who is important is the person who could go help that family anytime on an on-demand process. Think of how that could match helping a small struggling town in Milltown in Massachusetts have another source of revenue, putting the money back in the community as we go through there. Two, why don't we coordinate care better? There's so many technological components to ha have happened. I can buy anything I want on Amazon. But if I want to go find out about a patient who was discharged from somewhere else, it takes me way, way, way too long, and then I give up. So again, I think there's a new dawn, but I think this new dawn only happens with the three realizations is this needs to be disrupted, that our good work and narratives have to be supported by financial and other results from data, and that we have to expand the workforce to actually engage those who are already doing this work but need to get them to do it in a slightly different way. This story is about community paramedicines. 15% of their runs are our palliative care patients. But the reality is I need our personal care attendants. I need uh, anybody who goes into the patient's home to think of themselves as having a palliative care role. Thank you. Thank you.